Hi, Krish. Uh, good afternoon. How are you doing? Good afternoon, Alex. Good to be here. I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, yeah, really good, really good. Good to good to speak to you again. And uh, at this final uh, SaaS stock event of the year, we're talking about the speed of SaaS, and we've got 20 minutes to uh, ask and answer a number of questions. So uh, we we ins- uh, ourselves have to be a, a little bit speedy, uh, but excited for this. So let, let's get into it because um, we 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 really kind of understand about the right uh, sustaining the right speed of growth for expansion strategies to 100 million ARR. So. So, Chris, how did you determine uh, what is the right speed of growth for your company from 10 million uh, to 100 million ARR? Right. Um, I think we, we all want to build companies that are um, that that you benchmark against the global best, right? And uh, of course, the uh, the the best benchmark, right, is the TechCrunch article about triple, triple, double, 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 right? Article. And uh, especially when somebody has done that and then you realize that, okay, now that's a benchmark you want to try and s- scale to that. And I think it, it it's mostly about like, hey, do we believe that we can actually subscribe to that idea of scaling at that pace? Um, and do we believe that there is a market, right? I think the market has not, it has been in question maybe at the beginning of the decade, right, last decade, but no longer so, especially about SaaS, right? The market opportunity is huge. It's become a question of, industries you want to serve, the size of customers you want to serve and how you do that. And there are plenty of playbooks. Then it becomes, a it's mostly a question of internal constraints to believe, do I want to actually go after that? And if you have the team that is actually rallying behind that to say, okay, let's go after that. I think that becomes possible. Um, a pivotal moment for us is uh, getting to that one to five million in five quarters. Uh, that was a key. Once we got there and then on the path to getting there, um, there was this planning exercise that we were doing. And then we said, okay, now what is that that's generally considered the best uh, to scale? Then we, we did not really, like honest truth is we did not look at 100 million, but uh, at least to start with, we said, okay, hey, one to 10 million in under 10 quarters, is that possible? And then that puts you on the journey uh, towards uh, getting on that 100% year on year kind of a hyper growth. Uh, so that is what happened for us. And, and yeah, so the the triple triple double double that that's the Neeraj uh, uh, Agrawal from uh, is it, uh, Battery Ventures, the T two D three framework, right? That's correct. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, build versus buy. Um, so so uh, this year, Chargebee recently completed its first acquisition uh, with Revlock. Uh, so congrats uh, with that. Um, what are your perspectives and experiences on build versus buy? Uh, and what have been the impacts on the speed uh, to the road to 100 million? Sure. Um, so one, one of the things is, right, as, as founders, of course, um, we, we have spent a lot of time in one particular problem area, right, and built a lot of context around that, which is what gives us the um, the... The ability to make probably right at least you 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 believe in you learn to trust your decisions a lot more um, through that hunches because even if it's insufficient information you learn to do that through context. When it comes to acquisitions, something very similar happens where these are close adjacencies where our same customers have the same problem have a different problem right but in the close adjacency and you are trying to build for that. One approach to say like can we go build it? Right. It's not just sometimes, it's not just features and uh, uh, not just your product's natural extension. A, a space like revenue recognition is a, is a huge pain and a compliance area that requires deep expertise. And uh, in, in such cases, we believe that we are basically buying about 18, 24 months of time and also the time to assemble the team together to build so much of context that the founders have spent, that that team has spent three years building that context. All of that is what we are getting into the organization. So from that perspective, that's one. The second is we today serve more than uh, close to 4,500 paying customers, right? And uh, this is getting like on track to about $10 billion in TPV. And most of our customers who are scaling need a solution like that. So when we think about the acquisition cost of uh, any customer for a new new product line versus being able to cross sell this to a lot more customers where the customers already have demonstrated the need as a partner solution, it makes sense. So from that perspective, as we linearly scale one, which is charge B's growth, right? We want to be able to bring more vectors to this growth and also increase the LTV 
the lifetime value of the customer and also reduce churn by expanding the product offering. Uh, it's mostly driven by customers' need. And then uh, in, on the, from a revenue impact standpoint, even if it adds 10, base, 10 percentage in growth rate, because in the first year, you are able to add that much in cross-selling, I think it's a huge win. I think um, that's naturally something that we are going to see more and more of with a single product SaaS companies. Right? The Atlassian model was very innovative at the beginning of the last decade, but now it is becoming a common practice where uh, there are plenty of overlaps uh, in the problem space as well as customers are getting comfortable with solutions that are pre-integrated and readily available, especially for upmarket. Right? And that's a playbook, which means that we are going to see more companies even in the sub-100 million, which are going to be able to do a lot more of these multi-product uh, playbook uh, is something that we are going to see. So uh, I would say to answer your question, about uh, 10 to 20 percent impact in terms of how we, how quickly we will be able to do this. And, and we're seeing, I think, the, the session after this, uh, we've got uh, Johnny Bufahat from Hopin. Uh, they acquired, I think, a good, a good number of companies. Uh, so a, a very kind of uh, aggressive M&A from 50 to 100 million with Revlock being the first uh, from Chargebee, do you foresee you know many more coming in the uh, uh, in the future? There are yes. Good. All right. Well, watch watch this space. <laughs> um, and then uh, scaling internationally it, it, again, it's it's something actually Chargebee did from a very you, you know uh, early stage. Um, and uh, but for many companies, uh, looking at you know again, like I think the the stage it also depends, but like often from fifty to hundred million. There is this kind of uh, real requirement uh, to to scale internationally, scale globally. Probably scaling to the US if you're a European SaaS company much earlier, um, and uh, almost being born globally like uh, uh, like Chargebee was. So, tell us a little bit about your scaling international uh, sort of journey, uh, specifically as we go from this ten to hundred million uh, stage, which is a big stage, uh, and what you've learned uh, from that. Sure. Um... So for context, we have 93% customers between Europe, uh, US and Europe, right? 51% is US, 42% is Europe, and the rest is APAC, right? Even though the team is 80, 20 from India, and then 20% of the team is in US and Europe for us. Um, but it was not the case sub 10 million, right? Uh, almost 99% uh, of the team was based in India while we serve customers globally. and. Quite naturally, we were serving customers ACV, which was mostly sub 50K or sub 100K in, in, in ACV, uh, where the customers we were serving. So which means that the expectations of the customer in terms of customer support, right, all of that was different compared to when we, once you start putting the plan for how, what does it take for you to scale, let's say, um, even anywhere between 50 to 100 percentage year on year, right, between that 10 to 100 million, one of the challenges becomes whatever that got you here in terms of ACV size and the customer size of customers, it may not be the same for subsequent stage. Otherwise, the growth rate continues to drop year after year, right? Otherwise, or you need like a lot more number of logos. So that quite naturally informs the choices you make for your international expansion, in my opinion, right? So for us, one thing it has done when as we started winning more customers are, as our customers also grew uh, in ACV size internally and externally in the new customer base, uh, we started building the, the go-to-market motion uh, globally, right? So which means that the entire implementation uh, sales, pre-sales teams um, started having a global footprint to be able to serve these customers and bring them in. Uh, so that is one area where I would say, if, if there is one piece of advice, I would say, thinking about the complexity of the sale that we are trying to do, uh, and uh, that strategy informs the, the footprint of our employee base and what is needed to serve in different markets, uh, I think uh, is one area where I would advise entrepreneurs to start thinking about it in the planning cycle. This is one area where I made a mistake, uh, where we actually planned for expansion, but did not think about the support system that is needed to be able to support internationally. Right? And you tend to miss like six months to a year, figuring that out too late. Um, the second one is uh, on the customer acquisition channel itself continues to evolve as you get on the journey from in, in terms of growth, right? Which is 
uh, if inbound is a, for us inbound is the channel through which we built it primarily right and that is a really good channel that continues to work extremely well even for larger customers but it needs to be complemented by account based marketing right and subsequently even outbound channels or resellers uh, as you scale from as you do the planning between the 10 to 100 million and and that means uh, having teams that have been there and these are new playbooks right it's now no longer a founder led playbook because the first channel through which we scale the business and establish that product market fit to that scale to the 10 million is generally a founder led channel but beyond that right you are uh, you're hoping that you're building the necessary infrastructure and the support system for the rest of the organization to be able to do it better but that requires a little bit more investment than previously to be able to help achieve that i think those are two areas that i would say requires a little bit more attention and maybe um, more investment than you would normally do uh, as you think through the execution so i mean just uh, jumping on onto that uh, so there there was a time and i think there still is a a, a place and a case that many uh, saas founders let's say specifically in europe uh, when maybe they're getting series a they look at us like being the bigger market and they've got customers there and they look to set up office or they were going to you know san francisco uh, and the founder ceo was often that first person there uh, initially with charge b obviously the, the world has moved on uh, somewhat certainly over the last couple of years uh, with charge b you mentioned 51% us customers 40ish uh, sort of in europe um you were uh, based in chennai but now are based in europe uh is it because of we've got 41% you know of our customers there and why did you wait to you, you know for a number of years to to come to europe or or, or even to the us why uh tell us a little bit of, uh, about that right uh it's a great question the my move is mostly for internal teams like with with the significant now the us team is more than 120 people right and it is important that i'm able to and the europe team is about 40 people so it's important that i'm able to spend time with the us and european team as much as i do with the the india team which is why i'm centrally located right of course there is a the customer base but that i'm i'm very comfortable serving the customer base globally based in india right but the amount of time that we actually spend in um building the new teams right the amount of effort that goes into hiring retention and all, and the, the context building with all the new team requires a little bit more time overlap which is why i am now based in europe right i think an inspiration is daniel lex interview uh, spotify right uh, his interview about how he is actually based in europe and then operating the global company especially with significant uh, leadership based in us is the reason but i would say one thing that um, probably goes against uh, the advice that everybody else gives even at a 10 million stage right i would say founder staying closer to where the largest team is makes more sense to build a more cohesive team before you are ready to scale it globally um many many a times we hear about people saying okay now the founder when when there is no team in us or, or somewhere else one of the founders ends up moving there with the rest of the organization uh left here right simply because they want to set up a new team i think it's a little suboptimal because if the product is getting built services is actually delivered wherever it is right until it actually hits a certain scale and if your customers are not are still the new customers are you are winning are still 50k to 100k acv i would say you should be able to do it globally anywhere else so try and stay closer to the product teams is generally my advice right rather than actually going somewhere else makes it makes sense so let, let, let's talk about uh the need for enterprise and plg in this sort of marriage as such uh, um were you were charge be natively plg or enterprise uh, sales led uh, when you were crossing 10 million arr yes right we are natively plg serving smaller customers and then we went up market uh, we continue to move up market while serving both ends of the spectrum would would you agree that native plg doesn't understand the sales motion and the enterprise sales doesn't necessarily understand plg but they do have to coexist uh yes and no uh to some extent right uh, to qualify what i'm saying um 
I think uh, I read somewhere that 70% of the buying decision happens is complete before a customer, a prospect talks to the first sales rep, right, in your organization. And it's a mindset thing about the PLG, right? It's not about just the freemium free trial or the pro- um or just the product itself. There is more to PLG than these, right? Which is starting from thinking about your API document, API, API documentation, product documentation, and website as a first class citizen and right, and and in treating them as part of the evaluation as well as product experience becomes critical, right? Most developers interact with the API first or the documentation first before they even touch your product. So it's more of a mindset to be able to invest in this holistically. Um, in a way that you would think about the product red motion. That's one. The second part is uh, we have all learned over the now in the last few years that um, the try before you buy is a completely accepted model where there are multiple buyers in the organization, especially on larger deals, where there are numerous cases of examples that we can actually say about a developer who has explored the product, even tried, stayed in the freemium, even activated with the freemium uh, in the freemium program before they would actually bring a large enterprise to uh, the attention of the salesperson saying, now that I have completed my POC, now I want to talk to your salesperson in pre-sales, right? And then they will bring in um, the rest of the organization, right? And many a times we have seen that the domain names are very different, right? It's for a new product domain name, which you may not even associate it with the very large enterprise. And this is a very normal thing, I'm pretty sure, uh, a lot of us go through, including products, like right? whether it's a Loom or a, a Charge B, right? we all go through these kind of motions and, and that is now a generally accepted motion. So the lines are blurring between the PLG motion and enterprise motion, but what is now coming into practice is remote selling. The inside sales model, putting your marketing product and sales is now an accepted motion. It's no longer just sales, your marketing sales and product, right? So I think this uh, change has happened. And then of course, then there is a whole subscription flywheel. So you've given um, <clears throat> an example there in terms of the, this motion where you're, we're seeing PLG, we're seeing enterprise sales, or as you say, like marketing products and sales come together uh, as one motion and to get this flywheel. What, uh, what has been the impact on Chargebee's kind of growth by you know, having PLG or marketing products and enterprise sale working in, in this motion? Sure, right. I think the, the first thing, uh, it always starts with the, your Excel sheets from the annual planning, right? We couldn't have imagined being able to, uh, there are a few vectors to grow, uh, which is you can say, okay, can I, if I'm selling $10,000, uh, a, a $5,000 or a $10,000 product, can I get more of them as one vector, right? But uh, many a times you may find that your churn is high in this segment, right? And you may not be able to add that many number of customers within a particular time frame in terms of number of leads required and all of that looks disproportionate, especially when in the early stage uh, where there is only one channel, one channel working, which is it could be inbound with like a single trick, right? Many a times you know that you know AdWords really well, SEO optimized, and customers are discovering you online. Could be the one motion before something else would start kicking in. That's that's one of the constraints that every one of us have. So the second one uh, to think about is now then, if that is a constraint, now how do I scale this in a way that we go back to this T2D3 model or whatever is your number that, that you want to achieve. Now for that, one of the things we committed to was upmarket motion, which is deliberately, right? Up for us, the product required us to keep the promise, like a customer like Freshworks, we had to keep the promise that all the way from the first few millions, we'll be able to help them go all the way through an IPO, right, and service them beyond that. Now that requires an upmarket motion in product delivery, service, and all of that, right? And we are not going to do that for just one customer. We are actually building the playbook to do it for all customers. And, and that means the deliberate upmarket motion requires us to change a number of things inside out of the organization, including GTM, how we generate the leads, building the outbound and all of it. So basically, the idea, if, if you do the Excel math and think, okay, am I going to get similar customers, more of them within a certain time frame, or am I going to move up market? Am I going to unlock new channels? All of that uh, informs how we actually do it, right? 
So in the first approach to actually doing it, there is no way we could actually imagine how we will scale it. And then you, you hit a wall and uh, then you realize that, okay, now the approach has to change and then you start building the team around it. Right? And that is what happened to us as well uh, when it comes to the uh, how we execute it. Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think it looks like we've come to the end of the time there, uh, Krish, but really appreciate you sharing those insights uh, as ChargeBeat has gone on that journey from 10 to 100 million. So thank you so much, uh, Krish Subramanian, CEO, co-founder of ChargeBee, uh, for taking your time out today uh, to share with the SaaS doc uh, blueprint audience. Thanks so much, Alex. It was uh, fun talking to you. Thank you. Thanks.